Praise the Lord. It's good to be in Bible study um, tonight, and I'm glad that each one has made it in to the house of the Lord. Um, so anyway, we're over in the book of Exodus, chapter 25. I believe it's Exodus chapter 25. And uh, we just got finished dealing with the table of showbread. And um, so I guess we're going to go ahead and deal with the seven lamp, the seven lamp golden candlestick. So let's get on in it. We're going to have a good time. So God bless you again. We're glad to have you in the uh, in the Bible study with us this evening. So right now we're going to go ahead and pray and ask God's blessing upon this Bible study. Um, Reverend Serrano, sir, if you don't mind asking God's blessing on this Bible study, please. Heavenly Father, thank you, Lord God, for your goodness and your mercy, Lord God, for gathering us in this place. Lord God, thank you for each and every person that's listening in, Lord. Lord God, help us to listen. Lord God, take in what you're saying by your spirit, Lord God, to learn of you, Lord. Pray right now also that you help pastor, lead him, and guide him, Lord. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. And I guess it would be good to continue to deal with the presence of God. And that's what this um, tabernacle was all about. Um, God wanting to have a place where he can meet with his people and everything as the people offer up sacrifices. And so I want to start this out with this. Um, the presence of God, brothers and sisters, is a delicate thing, all right? And, 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 and before we get on with this Bible study, again, to God be the glory. You blame me for all the whatever happened that's bad, but give God the glory for all that is good, okay? And God uh, has a message for us tonight. Now, the presence of God is a delicate thing. And... And I say it because you have to, you have to really um, pattern your life after his will. And when your life is patterned after the will of God, which is the word of God and everything, the principles of the word of God, then uh, God, has, God will begin to allow his presence to be on you. And really, the presence of the Lord comes when we allow Jesus to be our Lord and Savior, when a person is sincere in their heart about wanting to serve God and, and they ask God to forgive them of their sins, that is the beginning of God's presence being on their life. And, and the thing is, is God is wanting to commune uh, with his people. The Lord is not trying to be a distant God from you. Uh, the Lord is not into um, long distance. He wants to be close. He wants to be near. And that's why uh, I believe it was the Apostle Paul who said, draw near unto God and God will draw near unto you. So let's look at how the Lord was dealing with the children of Israel in the Old Testament. Now, remember the building of the tabernacle is, is a shadow or really this, uh, a shadow of Jesus Christ. The entire Bible brothers and sisters, is about Jesus. The whole word is about the coming Savior, okay? The coming Messiah who had came and died on the cross. And so here in the word of the Lord, everything you see when, when it comes to the law, I want you to remember this, that the ritual part of the law, the ritual part of the law is the foreshadowing of Jesus Christ, okay? The ritual part of the law. And so these rituals were there purpose to separate the children of Israel from all the other nations of the world, right? With the circumcision and all that in the males and with the with the um, sacrifices and all and and not mixing cotton with wool and all this in the different things in the law that are not necessarily required anymore um, those ritual list those those rituals were uh, for uh, pretty much the shadow of the real McCoy Jesus is the real McCoy he is the real thing right 
And so that's all this is all about. So let's dive on in in this uh, dealing with the presence of God here in the Old Testament. Now in the book of Exodus chapter 25, verse 31, it's talking about the, the golden candlestick. All right. Verse 31, chapter 25, verse 31 of Exodus says, And thou shalt make a candlestick of pure gold. Of beaten work shall the candlestick be made. His shaft and his branches, his bowls, his knots, and his flowers shall be of the same. And six branches shall come out of the sides of it. Three branches of the candlestick out of one side, and three branches of the candlestick out of the other side. So there's three, and there's three, and there's a middle. So you got me, right? One, two, three. One, two, three. And then you got that candlestick right there in the middle, uh, our candle um, right there, holder right there in the middle. So there's seven fires lit, they're going to light. I want you to note that and underscore that in your mind. Verse 33 says, the bowls, uh, the bowls made like unto almonds with a knot and a flower in one branch, and three bowls made like almonds in the other branch with a knot and a flower. So in the six branches that come out of the candlestick, and the candlestick shall be four bowls made like unto almonds with their knots and their flowers. And there shall be a knot under two branches of the same, and a knot under two branches of the same, and a knot under two branches of the same, according to the six branches that proceed out of the candlesticks. Their knots and their branches shall be of the same. All of it shall be one beaten work of pure gold. So all this was one work of pure gold. It wasn't pieced in. Our God is a God of quality. He did not want a, a, a piece of anything. Everything had to be um, that they had to take that, that gold and beat it, shape it into um, what God wanted it to, to be shaped into, right? And so they needed men who were skilled in this craft to make it with quality. This thing had to be quality, right? And then it says in verse 37, it says, And thou shalt make the seven lamps thereof, and they shall light the lamps thereof, that they may give light over against it, and the tongues thereof, and the snuff dishes thereof shall be of pure gold. Verse 39 says, Of a talent of pure gold shall he make it with all these vessels, and that, that means um, that's talking about the weight of this gold. And, you know, it had to be of a talent. Verse 40 says, and look at thou, I like this part, and listen, brothers and sisters, you got to listen to me. And look that thou, or see that you make them after their pattern, which was showed thee in the mount. Now, and I, and I said that, and we know that it reads, and look that thou make them after their pattern, which was show thee in the mount. Now, the, again, this seven lamps, because you read about the seven lamps, I believe it is over in the book of Revelation. I'm not sure exactly which chapter, but the seven lamps represent the Holy Spirit, brothers and sisters. This candlestick represents the Holy Spirit. When you look over into the book of Revelation, and, and, and um, I don't have that scripture directly on me, but you can look it up uh, about the seven uh, lamps or, or the, the uh, candlestick that is before the Lord, right? Okay, and so anyway, and so this was required for God to except that tabernacle brothers and sisters this was a requirement of the lord the lord again wanted this thing done a certain way right now we are not we can learn a lesson from this from the building of the tabernacle because we are not to take the things of god lightly when the lord tells us to do something he, he, and he tells us to do it in a specific way as we understand it in the word of God, how that Jesus has um, given us commandment, even in the New Testament. And throughout the, the, the New Testament, you see um, the Lord uh, dealing with us through the spirit of God. Right now, not necessarily when it comes to uh, some of these ritual 
uh, orders that were made back in the Old Testament, but um, the Lord still gives us commands even in the New Testament, okay? So we got to be careful, and this is the thing, and not make a big deal of, of something that God wants out of our lives. This had to be done so God can accept that tabernacle, brothers and sisters. There are six things that are happening in this tabernacle. There are six things, and you can go online and you can see a picture of the tabernacle and everything. You can see the design of it. But there are six things that are, are going on in this tabernacle uh, when you don't count the curtains. And that is the Lord has, he has the brazen altar inside in, his, in, the, in, uh, in the outer court. I believe it is the brazen altar. Let me turn to it in my handy dandy date Bible. Okay, the, the tabernacle is made up of three sections. It's made up of three sections. You have an outer court where, and then you have an inner court where only the priest can go. And then you had the innermost court, right? So you had so you have an innermost court court, and they were all sectioned off by curtains or veils and there are six there are six items inside of this temple and I'm breaking it down this way because when we begin to read about all this stuff it, it'll kind of make you it, it can make you kind of confused you have the brazen altar which is right there at the outer court where they sacrifice animals and everything then you had the laver we're going to talk about the laver soon, where they will wash their hands and all that. And then once you get past the laver, there is a veil. And it was known as the outer veil. So, so you open up that veil, whoop, as Sister Constance would say, go inside that veil. That's where only the only people who could go inside that first veil were the priests. And that's it. Now, again, there's a right way to do things. There's a wrong way to do things. But then there is God's way of doing things. The Lord did not want any commoner going inside of this veil. He did not care if it was King David or King Solomon or whoever. They were not to go inside of this veil. And God meant business. For God's presence to come down God has to be honored, brothers and sisters, in our personal lives. We have to do things God's way, right? And it is not difficult to do things God's way. It is not difficult to do things God's way, especially when you are feeling the presence of God. And I'm here to tell you tonight, you can feel the presence of God in your life. I mean, you can literally feel feel God touching you and everything. It happens, and it happens quite often. It's not something that just happened a uh, hundred years ago. This is a thing that the, that the Lord wants in our life. He wants his presence to be on, on him, right? But God will not allow you to feel his presence or to know his presence if he is dishonored. Now, again, there's an out of that out of veil when you when you go into that out of veil, whoop, like Sister Constance would say, there you will have the candlestick, the the, uh, the the candlestick with the seven lamps on it that we just read about that was made of a talent of gold, beaten. It had to be shaped into the way God wanted it to be shaped with its knobs and all that under uh, and, and so on and so forth. Then you had, so, so let's do this. So when we go into the outer veil, we, inside of the outer veil, which is um, the inner court, you have the candlestick, you have the table of showbread that we talked about, and then you have the golden altar. And that is known as the altar of incense. And that is where um, the priests would come in and they would, they would burn uh, incense as unto the Lord. We talked about uh, the fire of desire in the last 
church worship service, and this is where the um, brazen, uh, the golden altar, or the altar of incense, was where they were to keep that fire lit. Okay, now, and if you can remember over in the book of, I believe it's in Luke, where it was Zechariah, he was um, inside of that part of the temple. He was he was uh, inside of that outer veil, and he was burning incense on the altar, right? And that's when Gabriel came in and told Zechariah that your wife Elizabeth is going to be with the son. And and uh, and Zechariah could would not did not believe what the angel had told him, though he's sitting there, and which is a, quite remarkable how that he's sitting there talking to an angel. He knew that this was an angel, but he still could not believe God, right? And so that's a whole nother message anyway. And so um, the angel said, because you did not believe, and he smoked, and he smoked Zechariah, and, and um, Zechariah was unable to speak. I don't know if he smote him, but he, had, he, uh, he took away Zechariah's ability to speak because he said, you're not going to, uh, be able to talk until this child is born because you did not believe God because Zachariah was saying how in the world is Elizabeth going to be able to have a child and I'm going to have a, a help, help her have a child how, how is that going to happen when we both are well stricken in age we're old as dirt and how is this going to happen and so Gabriel was smote him but this is what was going on and that was the uh, that's the account of John the Baptist how John the Baptist was born. So this is where John was, or rather Zachariah was, when he was burning the incense, right? And he could only go in that part of the temple. Then you had the most holy place. This is the inner veil. So after you get past these three items, the, the table of showbread, the golden altar, or the altar of incense, I like to say it that way, and the candlestick that we just talked about, once you get past those three items, okay, then you're going to go into the inner veil. And then once you enter into the inner veil, you are in the most holy place. You, and the only person that can go in that, into the most holy place was the high priest, right? And there, inside of the holy place, was the ark of the Ark of the Covenant, a lot of people call it, or the Ark of the Test of, of the Testimony. And so um, there is where the Ark of the Covenant, as we had explained in the other Bible study, is the place where uh, the where God would come. That's where the mercy seat was, the in uh, in between the two cherubim angels that they were made of, of beaten gold also. This thing was one piece. They were made of beaten gold. And I believe it was pure gold, and, and that gold was overlaid on the top of the of the ark, right? Pure gold was overlaid on the top of that ark. It was no wood inside of that gold. It was pure gold. This was the mercy seat of God. And there was where the priests would begin to uh, to offer prayers and everything for the people's sins. And and asking the Lord's forgiveness for the people's sins and all that stuff, right? And so, so the sacrifices was made on the brazen altar. The the there's three uh, three things going here. Brazen altar sacrifices made. The golden altar or the altar of incense is where they burn the incense, and the priest would go in uh, into the most holy place, and there he would make intercession for the saints, right? And so. Um, so there, and God said, I will meet you there. But that temple had to be right. Not only did that have to be right, that priest had to be right also, right? Because that priest was attired in, in a garment that God had specifically gave Moses the pattern. And it had to be made that way. It had to be made according to the pattern. And this high priest's job was so dangerous, brothers and sisters, that um, God commanded Moses to have a pomegranate on the bottom of the of his of his robe or of the of the I, I reckon that you would call that the ephod. On the bottom of it, you would have a 
a pomegranate and a bell. A pomegranate and a bell, pomegranate and a bell going all the way around the bottom of his train, all the way around the bottom of that of his robe there, his priestly garments around the bottom. So what happened was, brothers and sisters, now I'm going to tell you how awesome Jesus is here. What happened was in this shadow, in this shadow called the most holy place, they had to meet a holy God, brothers and sisters. They had to meet a God that did not put up with sin whatsoever. And only the priest could go in and stand before this holy God, and he had to be right. He had to go in to offer a prayer and, and, and everything uh, for the for the sins of for his own sins and for the sins of the people. And the purpose of those bells walking in was as long as they could hear the bells jingling, as long as they could hear those bells jingling that were aligned under the priest's train, as long as they could, they could hear those bells bling, 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 as he walk in, they know that everything is all right. It's like, whoo. But if they did not hear those bells, all of a sudden there was no jingling. That means God smoked the priest. That's how serious it was. That is how serious and how delicate it was in the Old Testament concerning the presence of God, right? But check this out. And nobody could go into those veils. Again, the, now the commoners could come into the outer court, all right? Then you had the inner court, which the outer veil was there, right? Okay, let's look at it like this. You come into the tabernacle. You come into the tabernacle to praise God. You can come into this veil. Everybody can come into this one, right? Woo, come on in. Let's have church. But then there's another veil, right? And only the priest can come through this veil here. So, you, so, so they can come in. Shoop, but then there's another veil that only one person out of millions of people could come in for God to grant forgiveness. And that was the high priest, right? But what did Jesus do? When Jesus died on the cross, right? The inner veil, the inner veil was ripped in half. And that meant whosoever will, let him come into the most holy place of God. And where is the most holy place? The most holy place is right here, or right here in the temple of your heart. When you begin, when you bring Jesus, who is the high priest, who did not do any sins whatsoever, he died for our sins, right? Jesus has made a way for all to go in to the most holy place. And the most holy place is literal heaven. When you pray, it, it is not going to be through some man. When you pray, you your voice literally goes up to the up into the most holy place of all. And that is uh, the, the true, the real McCoy, the real deal temple. God's temple. And that's the reason why uh, the, the temple that we will soon see after we pass from this life to the next life. And that is the that is the primary purpose of Jesus dying on the cross because he made a way for man to have a walk with God for himself. He made a way for man to be able to enter into the most holy place of God. And there are no veils. All veils are ripped. All veils are gone. All, all the temple mess, all these rituals are balled up and thrown away. And we are under a new covenant. And that is um, uh, the covenant uh, of promise. We're under the new covenant of promise to inherit the kingdom of heaven and inherit the earth and all that's therein. And, and I tell you what. It is something to get excited about because we don't have to come. That's the reason why the book of Hebrews said these words. It says, let us come boldly, right? 
Let us come boldly before the throne of grace. Let us come boldly before the throne. Listen to me, y'all. Y'all, a lot of y'all make this stuff hard. Serving God difficult when the difficulty has been torn up. I'm preaching now. I'm, I'm, I'm over here preaching. The difficulty has been torn up. This stuff is, it has been thrown out. Boom, it's not difficult. Because he said, let us come boldly to the throne of grace so that we can find help in the time of need. But a lot of times, people won't do that. They act like there's a veil, and there isn't a veil. But they have a veil, a veil of unbelief. And we got to say, we, and we got to quit making uh, walking with God and bringing forth the fruit of the Spirit and the abundant life in Jesus Christ and everything. I say this once and I'm saying this again. Quit making this thing so hard. The presence of God, you can feel all of us have a choice of whether or not we want to feel God's presence. Now, it's not all about feelings, right? It's not all about feelings. But when God touches you, Rev, you ain't going to sit here and say it ain't all about feelings because it's going to feel so good. You're going to be like, God, give me more. Give me more. Why? Because you're finally coming to the throne of grace to find help in the time of need. Instead of all this ritual stuff with the curtains and the rings and the knobs and all this stuff and make sure it's this color, make sure it's that color and all this. We don't have to go through that because there is one color that God sees and that is red. The blood of Jesus Christ. Man, y'all got me going. So, okay, so let's let's keep on reading. Now, I don't know if I'm going to continuously deal with all these things, but it's, it's worthy of reading. When I say continuously deal with these, uh, because there's a lot that's said in this all pertains really to the to the um, building of the tabernacle. OK, so chapter 26 is talking about the 10 linen curtains and, 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 and so on and so forth. Let's keep turning. All this is just the building of the temple um, and, and the outer veil and all that stuff. Chapter 27 is talking about the brazen altar. All right. The brazen altar where they were to uh, sacrifice animals. They did not sacrifice animals inside of the inner court. They did that stuff in the outer court. God said, no, don't bring that mess up in here, okay? Y'all do that out there. You do the sacrifice out there before that priest come in here because there better be a sacrifice. But if that priest come up in here without a sacrifice, I'm going to smite him and I'm going to let you know that I don't appreciate that, right? God's serious. But the, but the thing is, Jesus ushered in so much crying grace. Even that was grace. That was grace because God didn't even have to do that. The Lord already knew these people were stubborn. He already knew these people were rebellious. He already knew these people had crocodile tears and all this, that, and the other. He knew these people didn't care, but he still uh, made a way for them to be forgiven of their sins. But that sin was only pushed back for one year. For, for one year. It did not matter how perfect they lived. It did not matter how righteous they lived because the sacrifices, they were only a shadow of the real McCoy. Jesus is the real deal. Those sacrifices only can push away sins for one year, right? Those of you who run around with, with this guilty conscience and all this, you act like you living in the old crime testament and everything, making this difficult. Who hasn't sinned? Who hasn't done something that they regret it, uh, uh, that they regret that they did in their past? My God, if, if if we, uh, if we had such a clean past and there's not a man that hasn't done anything that he regrets or whatnot, then Jesus would not have come and died on the cross. We might as well keep living under the Old Testament and everything. Keep bringing that sacrifice because we stole somebody's whatever. Keep bringing that sacrifice because uh, we got in a fight with Joe Blow when we were 10 years old and we were bullying them and we were mean to them. And now we're sitting over here 45 years old still bringing the sacrifice for a sin that we did when we were 10 years old. Does that make sense? Then that's what people do with, in the New Testament. I see. I'm, I'm all fired up. All right, I, time is up. We should not live our life under condemnation. 
Brothers and sisters, he said in the book of Romans chapter 8, verse 1, there is therefore now no condemnation to them who are in Christ Jesus, what? Who walk not after the flesh, but they feed the Spirit of God. They walk after the Spirit, right? And so therefore, uh, we are not to live as though sins are just being pushed back one more year so that we can have some more guilt for the next year. All right, so... So that's what this is all about. I'm about to wrap up. I'm about to close and everything. But you got the brazen altar where, again, they offered up sacrifices to get, bring God's presence. And then you're going to have, I believe it is, commands for the priesthood over in the, in, in, um, in, in, in the priestly garments. I believe that's going to take place over in chapter 28. So we're going to go into study of the priestly garment garment so tonight's assignment is this i want you to go online go to youtube and i want you to take a look at um the tabernacle just type up the tabernacle on youtube and check it out it is fascinating but listen those things were only a shadow of jesus christ all right and church tomorrow night at 7 30 and i'm looking forward to it to it and we are still on the thread we talked about let Jesus dominate you uh, a while ago, and we talked about um, the fire desire, and we talked about, uh, oh, what was the other one? I can't even think of the other message that we were dealing with. Um, but we want to um, give, preach messages that will help you bring abundance of fruit in the kingdom of God, right? To, to help you see that this thing is, is really not that difficult. All right. And so special service, call it a special service tomorrow night at 730. Be there and and, um, and may God bless you. God bless you, Sister Cotton and Shimona and, and uh, Sister Greer and various ones. And I'm hoping that Brother Dane is on with us tonight. May God bless you real good.